Okay. Uh, good afternoon. We'll start uh, this session. It's called the Mutual Recognition of Qualification in Globalization. Uh, we have uh, two valuable speakers from France and Mal Malaysia. And we have two discussants from Philippines and Korea. Uh, let me introduce first the, our valuable speakers. The first speaker is uh, Miss Annie Bodo. Am I right? Yeah. <laughs> On your page 147, uh, there, there is uh, some in introduction for her. Uh, she was uh, trained as a social sociologist at, at the University of Hamburg, Germany, yeah. and completed her education the College of Europe in Brigue, which is uh, located in Belgium. So he, and even though she's uh, French, as you know well, uh, she has a lot of uh, global background. So now she's uh, Executive Director, International Relations uh, Center, something like that is uh, French. So she will speak about uh, mutual recognition of qualification in Europe, uh, I guess. And our second speaker is Mr. Bikneswaran Gopal. He is a principal assistant director in Engineering and Built Environment Association Division, a Malaysian Qualification Agency. Uh, she, he has also many uh, valuable experience in this area, the mutual recognition and recognition itself of qualification and how to make qualification in Malaysia. So we'll hear some good information and his experience in this field. And also we have two discussants, but I will let you introduce later. So we'll start now, Miss Annie Bodet. Two speakers each have, can have 20 minutes, so let's start. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, hello, everyone, and many thanks again to the organizers for inviting me and asking me to come and speak about all Europe. Um, well, my specific inside of this topic of our session, which is on mutual recognition, my specific topic was entitled uh, The European Common Market and Qualifications. Are there some lessons for globalization? Um, now I need, I have it. Um, so prior to starting, there are three sets of preliminary remarks I would like to make. And these preliminary remarks, I would not comment them. It is just because you will see later on that, in fact, the whole of what follows up is based more or less on these three sets of obvious statements, as I call them. The first set of obvious statements. While playing a role in the context of globalization, Human resources are not comparable to a tangible good. There are too many individual inputs of all kinds that make HR valuable, of which VET and education as a whole is only one element and qualification even so less than one element. The second set of obvious statements are or is VET and qualifications are deeply rooted in social relations. Qualifications are social constructs which partake of the general social contract. I'm sorry, but obviously it doesn't. Okay. Uh, the third set of obvious statement. The EU history in the field of qualifications teaches us some lessons worth keeping in mind. And the present French development 
display the strength of past dependency. Now, to fill out this obvious statement, uh, I will make my presentation along several lines. I would first uh, want to present you the EU history in the field of qualifications and in the field of mutual or tentative mutual recognition of qualifications uh, to end up with the new development in that field. And then I would like to present to you just very few elements of the French system of qualification that relate to what is happening at European level to finish with some terms of the debate at French level at the moment when it comes to complying with new European tools and methods. So the, I'm already in the second one, huh? it doesn't work like I want. Is that the first yes, one? one. Yes, sir. Okay, now I will get it. By the end of it, I'll, get, I'll be perfect. <laughs> So the EU history in the field of qualification. Our present attention today, here and yesterday focuses on globalization and on its consequences for HR development. And our session is specifically focused on qualification. And what happens is that, I'm not very good at it, obviously. Yeah, that's what I do, but see, well anyway. Qualification have been a main concern of European policies since the inception of the first common market in 1958. And the mutual recognition of qualifications has proved to be a very difficult task that Europe has attempted to approach in very different ways. Let me specify in this end that when we speak about European recognition of qualifications, we have to do to a common generalized and generalized approach to several member states at the same time. So it's not as easy as a bilateral agreement on recognition of qualification. So the very first treaty that, was, that dealt with The very first treaty that dealt with qualifications as an obstacle, as an obstacle, oh, I'm sorry, why doesn't it work? Okay. The very first treaty dealt with qualification as an obstacle to the freedom of settlement for regulated professions and trades. They require the possession of specific qualifications. And politically, this means that this barrier had to be legally removed by legal acts. And despite this legal obligation, it took up to 15 years and more to reach agreement between member states. And at that time, the member states were only six of them. In between, we are 25. The bitterly discussed issues did not only have to do with the content of the qualifications, and of the training leading to them. Professions and trades do have vested interests in keeping their numbers low, limiting in this way competition. And such professional markets will maintain themselves also in a global market. And qualifications will remain a main vector of their organization, and this despite any kind of recognition of and possibly because of that recognition. At a later stage in its history, Europe has tried to adopt a different approach to the other categories of qualifications, especially in the vocational field. I would just want to mention an organization that some of you might know that is called CDFOP, which stands for the European Center for the Development of Vocational Training and that is a European agency created in 1975. I'm throwing that to your face and I won't explain further what it is. If you want some, uh, I can, I stay here to give you further information. With an operation called the comparability of qualifications, CDFOP invited the vet qualifications experts 
of all member states at that time we were sometimes either nine or twelve, I don't recall exactly, but to compare term by term the content of work activity in some of the occupations and it seems like it could be easy to say we compare the content of work activity of plumbers, but this in fact proved to be very difficult or more difficult than expected. The involved person were, have been faced with the fact that this content differ depending on the ways in which production and employment are organized on the labor market. And that this content of activities are most often resulting from collective bargaining and they are stabilized in professional classifications. A tremendous amount of work has been done around the operation, resulting in a series of lowest common denominators with many comments that were necessary for each country to specify all, all countries' specificity. The achieved definition of qualification corresponded neither to a hypothetical European situation nor to any of the national ones. The operation was abandoned in 1993. The second attempt by CDFOP with the first setting up of a transparency forum, CDFOP laid the ground for the creation in 2004 of what is now called Europass. Organized as a portfolio, Europass consists of a standardized CV of the individual detailing the learning contents and the language capacities. Europass does not rule over, recogni over recognition, sorry. It de only details the elements that might support the recognition on an individual basis. In terms of mobility, it serves essentially the external labor market, trying to quickly adjust supply to demand. The next further initiative aiming at mutual recognition did not come from the European institutions themselves, but from the universities and from the higher education institutions in general. They had, in fact, a very important precedent in the policies adopted by the Council of Europe much earlier. At the latest, at the end of the 80s, European universities had under, undertaken a general policy of equivalent status, titles, and examination. I won't go into that. And this led to something that you all know, a common structure of studies in three, five, and eight years, bachelor, master, doctor. It also gave rise to the design of a European credit transfer system, the ECTS, based on units and points. One cannot say that this is a mutual recognition of qualifications. It is rather a recognition of training modules towards a uh, qualification. However, already accepting the module delivered by the neighbor as one of its own is a definite step towards mutual recognition. The most recent attempt to equip mutual recognition, and those are those I will talk more extensively about if I manage to push that button right. The most recent attempt to equip mutual recognition were born by the, with the New Century and the Lisbon Summit, followed by the Bruges Copenhagen process. Some of these names might be familiar to you. There is the so-called European Qualifications Framework, the AQF, and then the System of European Credits in Vocational Education and Training, the ECVET. At this stage, and as a matter of conclusion for this first part on European development and history, I would like to stress that all these various initiatives have maintained themselves. EU policies are still piecemealed while big efforts, I must admit, are being made to try to overcome those. So the present development, I will not get into the details. Once again, I'm sorry, but 
I thought I wanted to more problematize the problem of mutual recognition rather than give you uh, extensive information. Uh, so I will not go into the details of how is EQF built and how are ECVET constructed. But EQF is an overarching framework defining qualifications in terms of knowledge, skill, and competences with eight levels from level, level one, the lowest, and level eight, the highest. And these are supposed to encompass general, vocational, irrespective of how they've been acquired. The descriptors used by the AQF are not activity specific. They attempt to define levels with generic, level, ter with generic terms. I give you an example of these generic terms. I'm sorry again, but I have the information. You can be in touch with me anytime if you want that. Those uh, refer to the level four and the level five of that scale of uh, the uh, EQF. Uh, and uh, these kind of uh, descriptors are intended to serve as a reference for each country to situate its own qualifications at the appropriate level, generating, hoping to generate in this way a mutual recognition. So now, because of this present development and to help to support the work that member states are supposed to be doing, procedure for quality assurance have been worked out to guarantee the referencing work. And essentially, AQF is essentially a management tool of qualification systems. However, some countries are making use of it to review their own way of doing things. So this were the present development on EQF. This will be now the present development on ECVET, much shorter. The credit, ECVET are therefore credit units that can be accumulated towards a qualification. The units may be gained in different countries, and it is assumed that there will be agreement about the mutual recognition of these units. This recognition should be contractual between the parties involved, and the same unit may be gained in different settings, education, training, or work. The content of the units are to be expressed in terms of outcome space, that means what a person is really able to do. I just want to add that ECVET are in a phase of experimentation to help define their exact specifications. Well, despite the quick, the very quick skimming over these last two instruments, I hope that their respective remits is clear to you. I would like now to turn to some insights about the way the way in which the French players, stakeholders, are dealing with this new instrument. And I call that the French way. So again, I will not go into details about the French system. I'm very sorry, but the, my organization has a well done site, uh, internet site, where you can find that in information. At the heart of the, our system, French system, co concerning qualifications, are the National Register of Vocational Qualification and the National Commission for Vocational Qualification. You will not, uh, you will possibly remark that we don't speak, in French, we don't speak of qualifications when speaking about what is meant here with qualifications. We speak about certifications. So this is why you have the two Cs in the RNCP and the CNCP. So, when setting up the National Commission, Commission for Vocational Qualification, the law of uh, January 2002 has commissioned that commission, has commissioned that commission, with at least two tasks. The first one was to set up the National Register of Vocational Qualification. And the second one was to review the five level scale that exists in the French qualification system existing in France since 1969. So we have already a 
a scale of qualification since 1969. There are in France something between six and ten ministries delivering qualifications. We have sectorial social partners delivering certificates of vocational qualifications and many other institutions delivering nationwide qualifications. At present, we have 17,000 qualifications registered in our national register. So the CNCP, when it was created, was also in charge of putting some order into that world. I want to stress that this development at French level had happened independently and prior to European initiatives. But obviously it seems like they might go into the same direction. As for the review of the French grid of qualification levels, the mandate is still waiting to be worked at for both administrative and sensitivity reasons. I'd like to, qu to quick, quickly go over the elements of the debate around the AQF in France at the moment. So in the meantime, there has been some work being done in European projects trying to check the feasibility of introducing AQF, for example, and the use that could be made by French uh, policymakers. Uh, a French steering committee was put in place and has been set up with I don't know if I'm the right one, has been whose membership was similar to that of the CNCP. And discussion inside this Franco-French steering committee demonstrated both the resistance to change and the adaptability to a well-anchored system. I don't know. I, so I, I will continue possibly without the slides. Uh, one main controversial issue can be summarized as follow. Should the French levels framework be referred to the AQF levels as a whole or should each qualification be independently referred? with the, possibility the possible consequence that qualifications that are at the same French level could be dispatched at a different one at European level. And uh, how could this be possible? It, is, it could be made possible because of the different nature of the descriptors of the AQF. Then the for French relations, the attribution of a qualification level is not a mere management or administrative issue. The French level five qualifications are defined for each occupation and trade are defined as the first level of qualification. And social partners participate to the definition of what is that first level. And they have a sense of ownership of their qualification. So the question of the opponents to dis dispatching in different ways the various qualification on various AQF levels was that with which legitimacy would anyone decide that the first level of qualification for a truck driver is lower than the one of an instrument maker. But without going as far as destabilizing the French architecture the work to be done for both the legal mandate given to the Commission and to the EQF referencing will no doubt influence one another. A special commission has been set up that will look into this, knowing that the whole of French statistical apparatus will be impacted by this review of qualification levels. It can therefore be said that the AQF will have an impact on the French system, the extent of which remains to be seen. In any case, it provides some opportunity gains. A further issue about the AQF raised in the discussion that are taking place 
is the one referencing some, some of the qualification to the levels. While all state qualification by ministries are in phase with the five-level grid, the French five-level grid, the sector-owned certifications are more reluctant. In fact, in many collective agreements, national state qualifications are mentioned as classification thresholds between occupations. And this has wage and hierarchical uh, consequences. There is a general agreement between social partners that the certificate done by the sector and the social partner in the sector will be referred to in the collective agreements but that it, this should not have an impact in terms of threshold and in terms neither of the salary nor of hierarchical position. To allow the National Register to however know of these very important qualifications, an exception has been made at French level. What will happen at the European, on the European scale? So now I will not go further and I will stop here because my time is short, uh, or is, is not short, but I spoke too much uh, at the start. Uh, what I just want to add something about the ECVET is that despite some discussions, there is a much easier uh, reception, let's say, of the ECVET than there is of the EQF, and the debates are less strong. The, the only point of the debate is that Everyone sees the opportunity of making use of credit units towards uh, gaining a qualification uh, in terms of training, training, finishing a training and building up units for finishing up a training and having a part of the training taking place in other, in other countries. However, when it comes to having it being part of a French certification, for the time being, this is not being discussed, and it seems like it is very difficult because it will need for a big change in the way examination and evaluation of acquired learning uh, is being made. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you again. Uh, Mr. Gopal, you have a uh, floor. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers and the sponsors for making my participation possible. I feel very honored. And also, uh, much thanks to uh, Dr. Cho from uh, CRIVET for inviting me to uh, share the experience of uh, Malaysia, uh, Malaysian Qualifications Agency, uh, in terms of uh, recognition and uh, accreditation and uh, overall yeah, our quality assurance uh, uh, activities in the higher education sector. Okay. This is the outline of my presentation. Uh, I will speak something on the human resource development, uh, education and training in Malaysia, uh, the jurisdictions, and, and also the developments uh, in terms of the agency itself. Uh, or, okay, although we are formed in the year 2007, but we have been there for 10 years with a different name. And we now have a qualifications framework. And uh, uh, of course, when you have a framework, we have quality assurance systems and also uh, strategic alliances the agency uh, uh, has to, to move forward in this arena. Okay, if you look at uh, uh, us, we, the Ministry of Higher Education was formed in the year 2004. And prior to that, uh, we only had one ministry, Ministry of Education. Well, uh, I'm sure there was a pressing need uh, to form a new ministry because uh, uh, in the mid-90s, there was the high uh, liberalization of uh, private higher education because uh, the public uh, universities could not uh, sustain, I mean, there, there was not much places for students to go in, and uh, going overseas was no longer an option uh, for many because uh, it was getting more and more expensive. 
So the private higher education sector was liberalized in the 90s, and we ha it led to the birth of uh, private colleges and later university colleges, and now we have private universities. Okay, the Ministry of Higher Education, the jurisdiction is like uh, post O levels, and uh, we are looking at uh, the certificate, diploma, and degrees, these three types of qualifications uh, offered. And uh, the universities, we have 20 public universities now, which are fully government funded, and we have about 41 uh, private uh, university colleges and universities, uh, most of them are self funded, and a number of them are uh, government linked. Uh, in the sense of they are, they are funded by the National Oil Agency or the National Energy Agencies. And the polytechnics, they only confer uh, diplomas uh, at level five. We have 25. It's fully funded by the government. And private colleges, we have uh, more than 400 private colleges. Um, and the number changes every day. These private colleges do not offer um, a degree level, level six, but they do have arrangements with foreign partners uh, to award uh, 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 the, the, the delivery of program. For example, uh, qualification of UK or Australia can be fully studied in a private college. We call it uh, the three plus zero program, which means you do the three years here and you get the qualification in Malaysia itself. So that's a very popular option for a lot of our foreign students. And uh, we also have twinning programs where um, you know, if you cannot afford to finish your studies overseas, you can do two years in Malaysia and go for the final year in Australia and UK. It's very popular among local students and also foreign students. And we have community colleges, about 40, and they're all uh, funded by the government to support the lifelong learning uh, route. And this, uh, the total number of en enrollment is about uh, 850,000. Uh, apart from that, um, we also have other ministries and they have institutions of their own. The large ones, like the Ministry of Education, uh, they have the teacher learning colleges and, and we have the Ministry of Human Resources and Development, which provides skills training. We have Ministry of Entrepreneurship, Ministry of Youth and Sports, Arts, Culture and Heritage, Defense and Agriculture. So these were largely, I mean, um, when, when, because our agency was, is under the Ministry of Higher Education. So accreditation was mainly for uh, institutions under the Ministry of Higher Education. But, uh, but I'll show you later that now we are a national service provider. We are a na the National uh, Accreditation Center, which means that we are open to all. And if you want accreditation, you, you meet our standards. These are the legislations in higher education, uh, which you probably like to have a look. Um, we have the Education Act, 1996. We have the Private Higher Educational Institution Act, uh, 1996, amended 2009. Uh, uh, and we have the Universities and University Colleges Act, 1971, which was also amended 2009. National Council on Higher Education Act, 96. National Higher Education Funding Act, 97. National Accreditation Board Act 96, uh, that's already repealed. And you can see the date 96, 97, there were so many acts because that is the time where there was a mass liberalization, like what I've told you of private higher education and when there was the birth of many, many private higher educational institution. And uh, we, the National um, Malaysian Qualifications Agency Act uh, was uh, passed by the parliament in 2007 and that takes over the National Accreditation Board Act of 96. Uh, like I told you just now, um, before 96, uh, quality assurance was an internal matter of institutions. We had mainly public universities, and public universities had uh, much resources, uh, full funding from the government, and, uh, but their qualifications were recognized by the Public Services Department. They had a mechanism but they, uh, we did not have accreditation. So all um, the qualifications from uh, public universities were recognized by a process by the Public Services Department. But before, after that, like I told you, because we had so many private providers and they, we needed a regulatory kind of mechanism to ensure that qualifications are of, uh, you know, provide confidence. So we came up with LAN, that is the old name for us. And uh, we also had, in 2002, a Department of Quality Assurance for Public Universities. 
along the line 2004 we had the ministry of higher education set up and 2007 now we have the malaysian qualifications agency that was the first phase 96 to 2007 we we learned a lot and uh, now we have a framework we have the malaysian qualification framework we have a common framework for quality assurance and program standard we focus on institutional effectiveness, of course, and uh, we play a great role in the national higher education transformation plans of the Ministry of Higher Education. We aim to be Malaysia, a regional hub of higher education. We have, um, I think, a large number of uh, foreign students at, at, one, at one, one time, 50,000, I guess, and we have uh, been uh, increasingly a popular choice for Middle East students or any other foreign students who like to you know come here and complete part of their program before they move on to finish their qualifications in either Australia or UK but and and they, we also have postgraduate students who come into our public universities and uh, we aspire to be a regional hub a choice of center for uh, uh, higher education students and under the ninth Malaysia plans, if you know Malaysia has every, uh, five year plans, uh, the, there's a great emphasis on human capital for national competitiveness and sustainable development. And we have drawn up a national higher education strategic plan beyond 2020, year 2020, because in year 2020, we, exp we aspire to be a developed nation. And uh, the trust, uh, there are a, a number of trusts uh, detailing the investment in human capital world class, uh, one of it which is quality learning and teaching, uh, effective institutions. Uh, these are things that the MQA will play a bigger role. Okay, uh, just to tell you uh, about the migration, because in 97, we were known as LAN, we were a single board, uh, 10 members, we had a CEO. We only looked at private sector institutions and we solely focused on program base, which means that any private provider, before they get the approval to start a program from the Ministry of Higher Education, have to come to us to get a preliminary assessment and they have to get accreditation or at least minimum standards for their program. But after the Qualifications uh, Act was passed uh, in 2007, now we cover both public and private. We are the single national accreditation agency, but by act, we don't make accreditation compulsory, which means that uh, we are a service provider, but policies and regulations will might uh, make accreditation compulsory. Okay, like, uh, like uh, we, we don't say that uh, any program, you must compulsorily obtain accreditation, but if you don't get accreditation, the student funding will not provide funding for the students and things like that, so you have no choice. Uh, I mean, pr uh, public or private providers have to come to us to obtain the accreditation. How we work, we have accreditation committees, and uh, I'll show you later, and institutional audit committees from outside the agency. And we maintain a register of all accredited programs. And in our uh, acts, we say that uh, accreditation is perpetual, which means that we have no validity period. Why is that <laughs> so? But uh, previously, we had a five-year period, expiry period. But now, because uh, 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 for whatever reasons, uh, we say that if they may fail to maintain their quality, we will uh, revoke the accreditation, but, but, but we will do audits. This is our statement of purpose. Uh, we aim to be a credible and internationally rec recognized quality assurance body that inspires confidence in Malaysian higher education. And of course, any quality agency have to adopt the quality definition. We adopt fitness for a specified purpose. We do program accreditation, and also we are moving towards institutional uh, audits, and, and, uh, and, and some of the universities will be given self-accreditation status, which means they will not come to us for program accreditation. Okay, this is how we work. We have a council for qualifications. This is a high-level council. Uh, it's cross-sectoral and consists of Ministry of Human Resource, Public Services Department, uh, Vocational Technical. They meet four times a year, and, um, and they're made up of all the high-level government officials, and uh, they set directions and policies. And we have accreditation committees, which is also made up of uh, people from the profession, and uh, they made up, meet up every month. We have in institutional audit committee, 
and we also have the agencies. And we work closely with the professional bodies, uh, skills authorities, assessors, the stakeholders, and the experts for standard setting. So it's really a very, um, I would say, a very interesting place to work. Okay, this is how um, a picture just to show how our, our setup. We have a council. I mean, uh, we have a, no, a council non-executive chairman uh, sets direction for the agency, and we have a CEO appointed by the minister. We are a fully government-funded uh, agency, but uh, we are independent. Uh, we are independent, and uh, that's how we go. We have the committees, and. <coughs> For professional programs, we have joint technical committees. I will tell you later the uniqueness of our system. Uh, approach, like what I told you, we are cross-sectoral. Uh, we have the memberships from all the three major um, sectors, the skills, the vocational, technical, and the higher education academic. We intend to ensure the achievement of the uh, Malaysian qualifications framework which means that if you want to get accreditation, you have to meet the standards of the framework and we will uh, grant accreditation. Okay, uh, we focus on uh, internal uh, institutional quality management systems and professional programs, uh, professional statutory programs are evaluated and joint, by joint procedures, uh, I'll tell you later. Okay, for professional programs, um, previously, I mean like, uh, you know, programs with a statute, with an act passed by the parliament to regulate the professions, we do a three-in-one process, which means that um, they come to us, but we will liaise with the professional body, and we will liaise, uh, and, and they will do, we will do a joint uh, process to, to accredit the, the program. And the decision is uh, uh, adopted by us, the uh, uh, National Accreditation Agency, the professional body, and also the public services department of the Malaysian government. So we do a three-in-one process. So we help them by, you know, they don't have to go many times to all these places to get accreditation and recognition. So if it's a professional body, we have, uh, we have to, uh, we, we do a three-in-one process, and I think this has worked well, so that they don't have to go to many places to get their accreditation. This is the framework for higher education providers. Uh, we have the program accreditation. We still uh, have program accreditation at this level, but we are also moving towards institutional audits where uh, in some universities, including branch campuses of foreign universities, have been invited by the Minister of Higher Education to apply for self-accreditation, which means that you will not do program accreditation anymore. And uh, to do that, we do audits and we have the framework, and also we have the program standards and guidelines and policies led by the Higher Education Ministry. Okay, our framework, um, you can read on our framework. Our framework is also a you know, benchmark against the frameworks of the world, like from England, Wales, Australia. It's not much difference, you can, you can read it. Okay, this is our framework. This is our qualifications framework. Uh, we, got at, um, we had to discuss at least six years before it was passed by the parliament because it has to be consensusly agreed, nationally agreed. And we have three major routes there, the skills, vocational, technical, and academic. Uh, well, you can have a look at it. I mean, uh, uh, for the skills and vocational technical, it ends at level five now. And we are still work, we are, we are, we are, we are working towards the articulation processes because the skill sector would also want to move to level higher eight, you know, like, like elsewhere. And we have uh, accreditation of prior learning, we, we, but all these are still, you know, uh, at, we are develop, developing them, they are at development stages. These are the nine areas of standards uh, that we apply. That means, uh, if they want to get accreditation, they have to meet all the benchmark standards, at least of all these nine areas for the programs. It's the same for program accreditation and institutional audits. Okay, uh, partnering, uh, we have diversity and collaborations, uh, range and type and origins of programs. You know, like because we have private providers, we have franchise programs, twinning programs, three plus zero, which means they can complete uh, foreign qualification fully in Malaysia. We have public private partnership and we have done accreditation for most of these kind of programs. And we have also uh, important collaboration with uh, the uh, local uh, foreign QA bodies. 
and also uh, there's constant capacity building and sharing of best practices and we also um, uh, strong presence in APQN, a AQ a Asia Pacific Quality Network, uh, AQAN, ASEAN Quality Assurance Network because we are the interim secretariat and also the INQUAHE, the International Network of Quality Assurance Agency. We, we, ta we participate actively in all this, uh, this one. <laughs> and, and current activities. Well, this is what we do. I mean, uh, evaluations, accreditations, we do workshops, we uh, ongoing program, discipline standards. When we de uh, develop standards, we call in all the people uh, involved, I mean, to, to develop the standards. And, and we're also currently doing academic performance unit uh, audit for the ministry for all the 59 uh, universities and university colleges. And we also have our very own uh, institutional rating project, which is called SETARA. Okay, that's our publications you can download from our website. So in conclusion, I, I would like to say that I mean, mutual recognition is of course a government to government uh, process, but uh, I think one of the key principle is a good quality assurance system that will uh, actually um, promote or, or fasten the mutual recognition process. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, we have uh, two panel discussant. Uh, one is uh, the first is uh, Dr. Nona Rikafort. She is uh, now Deputy Minister of C Commission on Higher Education in Philippines, and also she serves uh, at the UNESCO, UNESCO Commissioner and Chairperson of the Asia Pacific Regional Committee on the recognition of degrees, diplomas, and studies in higher education. And our second discussant is uh, Dr. Jo Jong-Yoon. He is uh, a real organizer of this panel. He is uh, now research fellow, uh, CRIVET, uh, one of the sponsor institution for this conference. I guess uh, we have uh, 30 minutes, so each discussant can have 10 minutes. Uh, Dr. Nona first. Thank you, Dean Subong. A pleasant good afternoon to all. It is a great honor for me to be given this opportunity to give my insight on the very informative and impressive sharing of our two speakers, Ms. Bodder and Director Gopal. The issues at hand is most relevant as it affects our youth, which, is, which comprises the vast majority of the world's population. In line with our social responsibility, or even as educator, we must equip our youth with the skills, knowledge, and most of all, the right environment for further progress. In the recent concluded last May 2009, on the conference of UNESCO on the Regional Convention of the Recognition of Studies, Diplomas, and Degree for the Asia Pacific region. As chairman of this committee, let, allow me to briefly summarize the discussion in line with our theme, what our speaker had spoken with regard to Asia Pacific mutual recognition. UNESCO Asia Pacific Regional Committee prioritized its aim to find ways at advancing the mobility of students, higher education faculty and personnel, and the professionals in this rapidly changing world, which is our region, the major concern that must move on. Many post-secondary students as well as young professionals faces difficulties as they seek to pursue acceptance in foreign higher education institution, or even to secure employment with their credential. This is attributed to the inadequacy of the country's national qualification framework to assist their higher education institution in their country to understand this important need. As a major strategy in promoting mutual understanding and solidarity across the Asia-Pacific region, member countries are encouraged to develop their national qualification framework 
through developing their assessment, accreditation, and recognition tools to measure learning outcomes. We also saw the need to build national capacities and sustainable national higher education system by establishing a national information center attached to the Asia Pacific Network of Information Center for better networking on academic mobility and recognition. This will pave the way to the current demand of the what we call cross-border and transnational education. It's happening now in the Asia Pacific. This trend have increased tremendously. And in order to face these challenges on recognition and educational qualification, we in the Philippines have put in place our Philippine qualification framework. Currently, we have five accrediting independent bodies who have been currently networking with the other country accrediting body to make sure that our accreditation tools are acceptable to the Asia Pacific. Our tertiary program offering offers two educational pathways in order to prepare our student for this globalized world. The first one is the standard degree program, which we all have, which is heavy in theories. The latest that we have developed is the so-called ladderized degree program, where technical vocational courses, skills training, and hands-on uh, training are embedded in each semester. This gives the student the flexibility to be able to gain employment as they exist every semester in a particular job platform. And they can proceed going to their BS degree according to their time as long as they are able to afford the uh, time and the money needed. We had, this, the, we had put in place the ladderized education system in response to our country's three-point agenda, which are education for all, because it is affordable. You land into a job after the first semester, and you improve, you go into the next job platform as you go on to the years. It is also poverty alleviation, because our scholarship now can uh, expand, we only give the first semester and land the, the student into a job and let them take on with when we're having their job and go on night schooling to go on further. It is also a tool for job generation because the skills that we give are in line with the industry demand. As they exceed and come back to their educational pathway, we apply to them what we call the ETIA program, the equivalency, all the achievements that they have gained in work are given credits that were not earned in the four corners of the classroom. And so if they have worked for two years and they come back on their third year, they are almost done with their third year and they're already on their fourth year because they have gained a lot of credits. This will prepare them and will fast track the, our students to gain uh, knowledge and also to have a gainful job. As we, we see this now, this uh, so-called lifelong learning in the recent convention which we just came back uh, from Paris, uh, the Philippines was approved to be the lifelong center for the Asia Pacific. And with this, we are now designing uh, curriculums because we have many students that are out of school youth and have not finished their secondary level. And therefore, in the college students' uh, courses, the tech book courses can be taken by students that have not finished their secondary courses. They are classmates in particularly in the, second, in the tech book training. Uh, this will not earn them credits, but will land them into a job. So what we are trying to do now, uh, we have 
uh, we have tried to encourage the Department of Education, which is the secondary and the basic education, to promote Tech Book High School. Because in promoting the Tech Book High School, they infuse already the Tech Book courses, which earn credits to college, and which can land them into a job after their secondary course. This will now assist us in the poverty alleviation program of the country to be able to give education for all. Thank you and I encourage, we must all work together to put collective action to these opportunities and challenges to be able to help those that are in need in our country. Thank you. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to first thank the organizer of Global HR Forum for asking me to be the discussant uh, for today's presentation. Also, I am so pleased uh, to talk about the French and Malaysian qualification framework. Now, I want to uh, make uh, some comments and ask several questions regarding uh, two presenters. At first, I want to uh, raise common questions to presenters and then separately, I uh, want to ask questions to each of the presenters. Uh, as a common question, first, uh, the development of EQF, European Qualification Framework, started in year 2004 in response to requests from the member states, the social partners, and other stakeholders for common reference to increase the transparency of qualification. EQF, uh, being reference point linking the various national system of qualification is very much a political and pragmatic tool and not a scientific uh, empirical tool. It appears that French system is getting closer to EQF. And then my question, what kinds of benefits are expected to France by linking existing five level qualification framework to EQF. In similar context, uh, what are the important benefits for Malaysia by introducing MQF, Malaysian Qualification Framework, including the education quality control of a private university? How does Malaysia develop MQF in the near future in connection to Asian Qualification Framework? That is question to uh, Malaysian uh, presenter Biki. The second uh, question as a common, uh, EQF in the region and NQF between countries are very useful tools to facilitate workforce mobility. As you know, disparity in population scale between developed and developing countries induce a broad and rapid exchange of workforce between these two uh, categories. FTA, free trade agreement, is a worldwide phenomena. France and Malaysia are preparing FTA with other countries uh, through uh, MRA, mutual recognition agreement of qualification. Uh, my question is, what are your views uh, on the current situation of uh, MRA? In the case of France, does your country support developing countries to support for establishing their qualification framework? That is my question to, to Annie. Third question, in France, bachelor degree corresponds to 180 ECTS. ECTS means European Credit Transfer and Accumulation System. 180 credits equate to 4,500 hours of student learning time. It, it requires usually three or four year study in university. Also, master degree requires 120 credits. How do you set your notional time and what are the basic principles to operate the, uh, the French credit recognition and transport system? What are your challenges to work with ECVET? Already you mentioned European credit transfer in VET in the future. In the case of Malaysia, also require 120 credits for bachelor degree with 40 notional hours per credit. 4,800 hours student learning time are required to, 
uh, required to acquire 120 credits in Malaysia. So France and Malaysia have uh, almost the same credit scale for bachelor degree. So when uh, Malaysia set their notional time, they want to meet credit requirements and student learning time being demanded from university. And then I would like to ask to, to Vicky, uh, are there any other uh, guidelines to set up a notional time? And also, uh, separately, I ask to the France uh, delegate, uh, Ms. Ani. So according to European Commission, higher education provision in the major, uh, majority of uh, signatory countries is divided between academic program uh, in, in terms of ISCED, International Standard Classi Classification, uh, Classification of Education, 5A, and the Practical Oriented Professional and Vocational Program, ISCED, 5B. But in France, ISCED level uh, 5B graduates may also gain admission to studies at ISCED level 5A on the basis of a bridging program and recognition of their past record. The furthermore, ECTS credit are taken into account and permit exemption from all or, or some ISCD level 5A. And then I think that this policy is very important to link between academic and vocational program at ISCED level 5. How does pr uh, France implement on this policy in terms of uh, cooperating between related, related, uh, related ministries, for example, Minister of Education and Minister of Labor? So what kinds of objections from higher education side are prevailing in terms of linking ISCD 5A with 5CED or 5B? The second question, from EQF standpoint, level 5 in EQF means the higher education's short cycle within or link, uh, linked to the first cycle developed by the joint quality initiative as a part of Bologna pro, uh, pro, process. I heard that there are a lot of debates to link between level four and level five because level five belongs to higher education. The so EQF uh, descriptors show us very general information implying that differentiation between levels is not easy. How does France trying to connect between level five and level four in EQF in the future? What are your uh, principles and strategies to link uh, these two levels? And so the one for uh, um, Ms. Annie, uh, in France, the Social Modernization Act has become a main legal system in France for validation of informal and non-formal learning. All citizens uh, with uh, at least three years of paid or voluntary experience have a right to pursue a validation procedure of their skills and competencies. The France has a very long history to recognize validation. But I think that methodology to carry out validation is not easy and clear. In other contexts, Validation system is required a lot of time expenses to recognize various kinds of learning results outside the school. And then my question, does France employ policies to expand uh, validation in the future? How do you recognize non-formal and informal learning results as a credit based on outcome or modules based on process? What are the important obstacles to overcome in your future in terms of validation? And then uh, to uh, Malaysian delegate, uh, my question is, uh, MQF consists of three tiers, skills, vocational, and technical, uh, and academic. First tier is in charge of Department of Skill Development under the Minister of Human Resources. The second tier belongs to Minister of Education. And the third tier is responsible for MQA, Malaysian Qualification Agency, under the Minister of Higher Education. Cooperation among ministries and responsible organization is very key to manage and operate MQF consistently. 
Usually, there are many conflicts among three ministries due to taking over policy initiatives, looking back Korean experiences. So one mechanism is applied to solve conflicts among, among ministries and responsible organizations. That is my question to Malaysia. And second, according to MQF level four diploma and level five advanced diploma that belongs to three tiers does not differentiate. How does Malaysia uh, articulate among them? Uh, how do you graduate from skill and vocational technical tier access to higher education? And then uh, third question to you. To date, more than 1,000 NOS, uh, National Occupational Skill Standard, has been developed. Uh, NOS has been developing mainly on the range of MQF level uh, from one to five. And then I, I would like to ask you uh, to that, how long will it take to develop each NOS? How much fund did he provide to develop each NOS? Now finally, uh, I want to introduce the final draft of uh, Korean version of NQF that is uh, developed by Krivat researchers, many. Since year 2007, uh, national skill standard, Korean version national skill standard and Korean version national qualification framework, as you see in this slide, was formally introduced to the assist, the, assist the reform of TVET and vocational qualification system in Korea. The basic act on qualification has included the provisions on national skill standard and national qualification framework, thus establishing the legal basis for future development, improvement, and application of NSS and NQF. In this figure, present a final draft of L-level, the national qualification framework, with the consideration of similar domestic qualification system, SLVS, uh, benchmarking the principal foreign cases such as EQF and RMQF, Regional Model, model Qualification Framework. A level qual national uh, qualification framework not only allows uh, comprising of vocational qualifications applied in Korea, but also allows comprising of academic degrees and similar educational qualifications. And finally, I wish uh, that my comment and question have induced many uh, questions from the floor, and then this, make, this makes uh, this session so fruitful to make meaningful implication for the Korea, Malaysia, and France. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Joe raised too many questions. <laughs> so uh, we have a short time, about 10 minutes. So I propose. Uh, it's a better idea to hear from the uh, floor. Then after then, then we, I, I give the chance for replying. Any other questions? Yes, please. Do you have a mic over there? Just, just a moment. I think this topic, I would just like to suggest that next year we devote more time because this topic is very important. And, uh, you know, we have wonderful <laughs> resource speaker here. And this is my, uh, I just, uh, well, it's quite clear that it's still the state, the government. And we are your whole government <laughs> in the middle. But, you know, supply, demand is not here. So, how we how we how we bridge this gap? You see, it's a, it's a very big uh, problem, and there's a lot of wasted of human resources. Many people are unemployed as a result because we are unable to bridge the gap. So how how do we strengthen the state institutions? Because we are, we are regulators, we have power <laughs> to uh, to do it actually, and there is no globalization. I see, it's still national state government initiatives. I don't know. So thank you. That's my comment. Just one more. Okay, please. Mike, Mike, please. Good afternoon. 
My name is Bo Che, attending Art University um, as majoring in engineering. So anyway, thank you for giving me an opportunity to uh, say, speak, to speak something about the topic. Yeah, I would like to ask uh, what kind of benefits can be achieved by setting up those level of qualification or certification uh, mentioned for uh, total mechanism global, of global dimension were related to other countries uh, which is trying to get a certification or looking for that. And uh, why those qualifications are uh, sound, be, sound to be permitted for, and like one, one more I have, un I have to ca ask about this one is that uh, I have under the vague understanding for the uh, why we need to sincerely focused on having this uh, mutual understanding of the global recognition. I, is your question you. to directing to? Uh, to any and, um, and both? Yeah, related to uh, this topic. OK. Yeah. OK, floor is closed. We have uh, only five minutes, please. <laughs> Uh, I think there's so many questions. Uh, I can provide five minutes each. Uh, Mr. Gopal first. Well, uh, thank you very much, but uh, I didn't quite get the questions. <laughs> but, uh, well, if you say probably uh, the benefits of having a framework, well, of course, uh, having a framework means it's uh, the country's declaration to the world about your qualifications. So that would be a uh, basis for mutual recognition. And of course, uh, with mutual recognition, it would mean mobility of the workforce, you know, much uh, in a much uh, easier manner. So I, I, I guess that I'm definitely there are many benefits to the frame to, uh, in having a framework. But of course, you have to have the pressing need to have a framework, but because some countries, I think like Singapore, they, they, don't, they say they don't need a framework because they are small and they, they can manage the institutions. So you have to ask uh, yourself, I mean the country, do you need the framework? Then come up with it because it's a lot of work and you have to maintain it via quality assurance procedures. Well, uh, I, w I, will have, I would have another kind of answer is that, um, first of all, I'm not a state organization. I'm a public research institute, which makes it uh, easier to take some distance from policies. <laughs> um, and what I wanted to say is that uh, I'm asking myself what it will be good for to have a European qualification framework. But I understand that this is the next, st this is the next step at the moment that every state has agreed to go for, uh, hoping that in, in all the developments I have pr presented what happened in the past, it, it never really resumed in the, any way in, in the uh, global rec uh, recognition. So the hope is that with these so-called overarching and so-called neutral instruments, uh, which obviously from what I explained to you uh, of the di present discussion at French level, it's not so neutral as it shows because it does throw a lot of, uh, there is a lot of uproar in, in French qualification world uh, about the way the things should be done, okay. Um, now, I think that there is, a, there is a case for mobility. There is a case for those students that want to study like uh, it was explained for Philippines and like it was explained also for Malaysia. Uh, and, and, and I'm sure that there, there are a lot of French youngsters during their university studies that are going abroad. But again, we then are talking only about higher education. And my institute is specialized in vocational education and training. And if I, if I speak to my plumber next door, uh, whether he's going to be mobile, mobile and make use of the European qualification framework, I'm sure he doesn't even know it exists and I'm sure he, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't really be moving around. But uh, I think this is, that's why I was trying to say earlier that for me the EQF and the 
not, not the ECVET, but at least the EQF, is a management tool for those that are managing their national systems. So it, it helps them understand, it helps them better understand each other and also building the bridges, which once in a while are necessary if, they are, uh, if, they, if some people want to make use of it. Uh, I don't think that it will be a revolution in the definition of, uh, uh, of qualifications, uh, for the time being at least now. Uh, this would be the answer I would be giving at that. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's uh, the right time, but uh, I don't want to summarize this session, and even though <laughs> I don't try to conclude any remarks. But it is clear to me uh, some many questions and issues uh, still remain unresolved. So uh, Dr. Joe must uh, provide another session, maybe next year, <laughs> to resolve these unsolved questions. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you again uh, to valuable speakers and to, again, uh, to discussant and flows also. Thank you very much.